Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. <laughs> well, we got so many wonderful family here, and they're from everywhere. That it just—I ask you, what should we talk about tonight? And somebody said heaven, and somebody said uh, um, angels, and somebody said the mercy of God, and and only Bill Steltemeyer said purgatory. <laughs> and so I asked the audience, how many of you want me to talk about purgatory? And about six. So. Even in almost 1994 years, nobody wants to hear about that place. <laughs> so, since it's there anyway, I'll let you find out for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> there's no use me talking about it. Well, we had a kind of um, a, a, a mixed joy today. Um, <laughs> the Holy Father approved altar girls, and the liberals are so excited because it came from the Vatican. It's the first time they've been obedient for 30 years. <laughs> in 3D years that they haven't picked apart, dissected, you know, put it in, in file 13, you know where file 13 is. And uh, I mean, it's been wholesale rebellion. And this is the first, I thought, we're making advancement, folks. Even the liberals are finally getting obedient. <laughs> Well, I thought it'd come sometime, you know. You, if you keep it up, you go another place that we didn't even mention tonight. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, folks, it did come through. I'm going to read it to you. Everybody's been calling today, and some are disappointed, some are angry. So, but I'm going to tell you, just put on the brakes, folks. Uh, it isn't as bad as it looks. <laughs> but it performed a miracle, didn't it? It made every liberal priest and bishop obedient on contact. <laughs> and that's good fruit. We don't mind a few girls traipsing around the altar if it does that, you know. If it makes them obedient, then we have accomplished a great work. 
So anyway. <laughs> Oh, well, we're having fun anyway. <laughs> Honey, let's see what this little document says here. Hmm. It says, the Vatican has approved the use of female altar servers. A letter to the bishops' conferences around the world dated in mid-March said service at the altar can be performed by lay people. I, I'm glad females are considered lay people. <laughs> Whether they are male or female, the ruling on the church law that clarified the polity was confirmed by Pope John Paul II. And what that means is that in the canon law, it never mentions it. It says that everything is status quo, but if something extraordinary has to happen, it can do, be done by the bishop's conference or whatever. So that's what they did. And many people are asking why. It says here, though, and we got, you see, Holy Mother is a church. I mean, Holy Mother Church is a mother. And even though sometimes she is constrained to do some things, um, she always is motherly about it, always motherly. And so what does it say here? The policy is optional for each bishop. So if you don't like it, then yell at your bishop. Depending on the local pastoral needs. Now the bishop, after hearing the advice of the National Bishops' Conference, uh, can then make that decision. So he can make the decision on his own. And that to me is a, a little leeway for those of us who don't like, who don't approve of altar girls. It's just a matter of vocation, so see. So, but let me, somebody, everybody has, in fact, everybody that has called today asked, why? Why the change? Well, I gave my humble opinion. You want my humble opinion? <laughs> Thank you, because you're going to get it. <laughs> anyway. Um, about two years ago, in November, the Holy See was presented, the uh, propagation of uh, faith, was presented a inclusive language catechism. And um, that's where we won a great battle. We did, where we thanked the Lord and our Holy Father and the Holy See for being strong when it comes to faith and morals. And so that catechism was sent right back, and then it was sent back to Rome, and Rome had it retranslated in good old-fashioned regular English. Nothing horizontal and nothing vertical, inclusive language just old-fashioned English. So what I want you to know is we won the battle of the faith and morals in the catechism. That's what's important. That is what I admire Cardinal Ratzinger, the Congregation of Faith and Morals, our Holy Father, that they were willing to make the English translation wait over a year before, before they would approve. Now, the altar girls was asked at the same time. And although many of us don't approve for vocation reasons, uh, I think that it was one of these diplomatic uh, decisions, uh, concessions uh, to our bishops here, Canada, wherever, to make them feel better. That's my humble opinion. 
You know what would happen if your son asked for a car? But he's too young. And so, instead, you get him a bicycle. Got that picture? Okay, so he goes off on his little bicycle, but the car is nice and safe in the garage. That's what happened. See? The doctrine and the dogma uh, is safe in the new catechism. That's the car in the garage. The bicycle are the altar girls. <laughs> it makes them do their thing and go where they want to go. But it never touches the car. You understand what I'm saying now? Huh? So understand that even though our Holy Father or the congregation, this one or that one, had to for some reason make a concession. Maybe they did it hoping the liberals would stay in the church. You got to make them happy. Well, you made them obedient for once, and that's great. I'm happy with that. So we have to get everything in its right proportions. So rejoice with us that a great thing was wrought today. It's not a doctrinal matter. And only time will tell whether that boy gets hurt on that bicycle. He could kill himself, you know, even on a bicycle, huh? The only time will tell us all whether that bicycle was a good thing to give him or whether somebody said to him, play in the yard close to home. Only time will tell. Don't allow a little thing to forget, make you forget. The car is in the garage, safe and sound. That's what you want to think about. Do you all agree with me? That's a kind of simple thing I brought up. I want to explain to you the joy in my heart over one liberal who becomes obedient. <laughs> Never thought I'd see it. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I hope you go all the way up. Well, now we're going to talk about a lot of things. We'll have a spiritual smorgasbord. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah? No pickles tonight. <laughs> Good meat and potatoes. We're going to start meat and potatoes with a little bit on vocation. Now, you want to ask any questions, even all of you here, just raise your hand. I don't know how we'll hear you, but we'll make it. All of you there, if you want to ask a question, please do so. Anytime. I don't mind being interrupted. That's what makes this program so exciting. Now, um, a vocation. I don't know if some of you saw Sister Agnes' his solemn profession. Yes. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. What happened on Saturday was that Sister Mary Agnes has been here eight, it takes eight years to dedicate yourself to God as a cloistered nun with solemn vows. And I don't know if you, somebody said we put a sheet on her. That was not a sheet. <laughs> that was a very beautiful pall that they put on your casket. I thought, how distressing to think I put a sheet on her. <laughs> After eight years, all she got was a sheet. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, this pall was put on her by four sisters and two candle bearers. We said the litany of all saints. It was a great symbol of her being dead to the world and alive to God. See? 
That was the invocation. Oh, Lord have mercy. And then we, invo we had it, 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 all the invocations of all the saints. And then she made her vows, and the sister and I both signed the paper. Now we will contact her pastor and tell her that she has solemn vows. She can never sign another contract. She can't really do anything. She can never possess anything. So if you send her a hundred dollars, it comes right to me. <laughs> It's funny how money always comes to my mind. I can't. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? But the whole idea is that you make a total, total, total consecration to the Lord God. And then the, the priest put a ring on her finger. It took eight years to get this ring. He said, I espouse you to Jesus Christ, Son of the Most High Father. Receive the ring of faith. Whew. Wow. That's what vocation is. And vocation for the priesthood is so high. You know, there's such a dirge of vocations today, and I could give you three hours on why there is a dirge of vocations, but I don't want to waste that time. A vocation is to say, I belong to God. I was created by God. I love the Lord. And I want to give my all to him. I want to wear myself totally out. That's what it means, vocation. Vocation is not an easy thing. No more than your married life is an easy thing. But none of you had eight years to make up your mind. <laughs> she is eight years, but why? Because you're dedicating your life to the Most High God. And everybody in heaven will know you are spouse of Jesus. See, there's special graces. Everyone in heaven will know that this young man is a priest of God, that he has the power to consecrate bread and ordinary wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. You need to pray for vocations, especially now. We want the kid on the bicycle to make it where he's going and home. We don't want any accidents on the way. We want more vocations, a lot more vocations. You need to pray for vocations. You know, Sister Agnes got a card, and she started to cry when she got it. Looked like an ordinary greeting card, written by a cousin of hers. And what he said, he said something, I don't remember the whole thing, but it said, amazing, but the scratch on that post took 40 years to realize that prayer. And I thought, what scratch on what post? Well. Sister's great grandmother, when she'd be working in the field, she'd say a decade of the rosary. And every time she said a decade, she put a little scratch on the post. She always prayed that somebody in her family would have a vocation. It took 40 years. But what a vocation. Total, absolute commitment. Nothing held back. Give it up and give it all. And that is the essence of vocation. So I ask you tonight to make vocations to the priesthood and religious life real vocations. Not carrying placards and having all kinds of hidden agendas and very visible agendas and all this kind of thing, but a vocation to God and then to man. See, we got to have both. So we said that's on vocation, okay? The next subject was heaven. Heaven. Well, it's hard to imagine heaven. 
it's hard to imagine me living with the few liberals I'm thinking of right now. <laughs> I, uh, I don't... <laughs> I'm just thinking for a moment what I would do if I saw this one in particular. Well, but if I were there, then I'd have the right dispositions, wouldn't I? And I'd say, oh, I love you. <laughs> I think. <laughs> no, I would, I would say, I love you. And, and he would say, I love you too. And all heaven would rejoice that these two finally made it. <laughs> but that's, that's how it really it's going to be. You got a favorite enemy? Everybody does. <laughs> yeah, if you may be sitting next to them, who does? Everybody has a favorite enemy. And we hope and pray you both get there. And it's, it's all going to be so different. You're not going to have all of these problems and, and fussing and fuming. Of course, with the liberal I have in mind, he's going to know we were right and he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. But you see, we're all going to be able to, to love the Lord, and in loving the Lord, being one, one with God, then we're, we're going to love each other, everybody. It's even hard to imagine, isn't it, huh? Some people you have a hard time loving just because they have a wart in the wrong place. <laughs> Or, or they don't like the way they comb their hair, you know? I remember when I was a kid, I don't know how it happened, but every Sunday when I went to church, and I didn't go that often, but every Sunday when I went to church, I always got in back of well, this one woman. I never got in back of her. She got in front of me. And I couldn't see a thing. I mean, she had a hat that just went like this, <laughs> and it built up. Then there were the sisters who had this thing that went way up. <laughs> well, see, there's all kinds of little things. They, it doesn't matter. Sometimes we just don't like the way some people eat. Did you ever notice that? I went to a restaurant one time with somebody, and, and they just started, and it never stopped. <laughs> it was like a, an invisible shovel down here that just kept going down, going down, going down, and I, I, I just watched for a minute, because it... <laughs> and I, I looked around for fear. Somebody was looking, you know, I thought, how do you do that? <laughs> then they took a glass of Coca-Cola and it all went down one time. <laughs> These little things bother you, don't they? Little bitty things. People pick their teeth and <laughs> just a lot of little things. Well, sweetheart, I got news for you. None of those will be in heaven. <laughs> Not a what. But you see, we will realize in heaven that on earth we loved for the wrong reasons. See? We love for the wrong reasons. We love for what people said or what they did or how they acted. We loved for the wrong reasons. And in heaven we'll love because they look like the Lord. Because we know for sure that God is our Father, and we're really brothers and sisters. 
They, we're going to know that for sure. And there won't be all these little superficial, and they're all superficial. Oh, my. They're superficial. We get angry at each other for the stupid things. We really do. And they really don't amount to a row of pins. But see, in heaven you're going to love because there is that awesome love of God constantly permeating your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, everything. And you're going to look at everybody with love. See, somebody looked at you with love right now, you're suspicious. What does he want? <laughs> I told you the time this man came to me. Some of these stories bear repeating because they're so true. And this man came to me, he said his wife was jealous and she was going to leave him and blah, blah. And I said to him, why'd you send her some flowers? He said, are you crazy? I said, no. <laughs> send her some flowers. No. She'll be suspicious. She'll think I'm running around with somebody and I'm just trying to make her feel good. I thought, ah, she wouldn't do that. You're sure? I, I'm sure. So about three days later, I get a call from his wife. So the voce on the phone. I got flowers from my husband this morning. I said, oh, isn't that nice? No. <laughs> he must be running around. <laughs> I said, yeah, I know. She said, how do you know? Who is it? I said, me. <laughs> I said, you, you are... You're something else. You're crazy. I, I told him to send you those flowers. And he told me exactly what you would do, and you did it. But you know what patched up their marriage? Because she realized how silly she was. And, and that's why in heaven you're not going to have any of that. No faults, no weaknesses, no pain. No pain, no headaches, no fatigue. Oh, God, I, I think I was born tired. I looked two months old when I was born. My mother never let me forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been tired ever since, did I? <laughs> but just imagine there won't be any fatigue. And a, a, a moment will be a, a, like a thousand years. A thousand years will be like a moment. It'll be just like that. You'll be full of joy and full of happiness, and you'll see people that you're surprised are there. <laughs> and they'll be surprised you're there. <laughs> but you're going to have all these little joys, you know? Seeing your great-great-grandfather. I'd like to see my great-great-Uncle Pete. Well, I never saw him because I, he was dead when I was born, but... I liked the way my mother talked about him. He'd go in the garden and he'd sit down with my mother and he'd take a, a tomato off the plant and he'd put salt on it and chew it and eat it and he'd give her one. Great. Simple man. But you're going to meet all your friends and all your relatives and you're going to meet all, all the saints you loved. You know, right now, they're kind of spiritual celebrities, but up there, you can walk around the corner and say, hi, little flower. <laughs> or St. Augustine. I'd like to know all the things he did in that book he wrote. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, how did he get to love the Lord so much? 
How did he have that total confidence in God and that total awareness of God's love for him so that his whole life, his whole past life never bothered him? Wouldn't that be wonderful in your life, huh? I mean, we, maybe we could find that out. First of all, I want to just spend a little time with Our Lady and ask her all the things about Jesus I'd like to know. I could just feel some of our liberals say, there she goes with all that pietistic stuff again. Well, it's better than your God of wisdom, or whoever she is. <laughs> we have a call. Hello? Oh, good evening, Mother. <laughs> Hi, where uh, are you from? Minnesota. What is your question? Well, first, if you're always tired, I wonder what that says about me, because you <laughs> seem to have so much energy. <laughs> um, my question is, is, you know, the apparent lack of vocations. We know yeah. that God has granted the vocations. Mm -hmm. what, what are the implications um, for people who... God had given a vocation and they chose not to follow it. In other words, they married or they did something else. Is there, are there spiritual ramifications? Well, I think, I think in the first place you would have to question whether there was one in the first place. I think a lot of people do mix up vocation with the desire or the call to holiness. All of these people here um, have a vocation to be holy. That's their first vocation to be holy. And everybody thinks if a girl or a boy goes to Mass every morning, goes to a community, oh, you got to be a priest or a nun. That isn't true. Maybe you want to be a holy layman, even a holy lawyer. You see, God, first of all, calls all of us to holiness. That's why you were created by God. Then he calls you to different ways of becoming holy. Some people become holy through married life, single life, uh, a career life, religious life, priestly life. So he calls you to that degree of holiness for you in that state in life where you can become the holiest, the easiest. So let's say maybe you didn't know. Let's say just for the sake of answering your question that you did have a vocation and you didn't follow it and you got married. Do you think our Lord's going to do something terrible with you? Even here, the important thing is that whatever other life you chose, you live it in a most holy way. See, not degrees of glory, we can, nobody can tell you that. That you live it, you be a good wife, a holy wife, a holy mother, or a holy single person, whatever. So I, I would speak also to nuns who live in very liberal orders that are having a hard time, good, faithful, traditional nuns. They have persecution within and without. I would speak a minute to you. Perhaps you will save the sisters in your order. Perhaps she wants you in another order. Perhaps your pain is your source of holiness. Perhaps your patience will make another person desire that perfect abandon to the will of God. We live in very difficult times, and yet they are glorious, because today we can become greater saints than any of those in the past, because we live in a day of great persecution, greater than before, because it takes a lot to stand tall consistently no matter what happens. So I hope I answered your question. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother Angelica. Where are you from? 
from Memphis, Tennessee. And what is your question? I'm calling concerning uh, the secular Franciscan order, mm -hmm. and I would like uh, very much uh, for you to uh, address the uh, secular Franciscan order, and I think my appeal is that as we are called to be holy, and as each individual person may feel that, that they would like to live the gospel, that they feel within their own life as secular people that they would consider the vocation of, a, of the secular order, right. and specifically the secular Franciscan order. Uh, to which uh, I belong, mm -hmm. and I would like for, for them to know that they could contact their parish and, and find out uh, about what this life is and, uh, and, and what we're trying to do. Right. I think there are many secular, uh, third, what are they call third orders. Huh? You belong to third order, some of you. There's Carmelite, Franciscan, Dominican. The whole essence of all the third orders is to live a holy life as a secular. It's a help. You have certain prayers you say, the Mass, there are certain things you have to do. And so it allows you to keep close to the Lord. It gives you community, which few people, few people have today. Everybody seems to be a little isolated entity. See, that's very bad. That's why I think busloads that are coming here, and individuals, too, you're together. And you come here in this wonderful, isn't that chapel great, huh? You come here to worship your Lord and God in an atmosphere of peace and joy. It makes you family, see? That's what's wonderful about our network, is that we're family. See, we're family. We believe in life. We believe in supernatural life. We believe in our human existence life. We believe in our social life, our family life, our community life. We believe in living the gospel in all these different ways. Now we have another call. Hello? Hello. Where uh, are you from? I'm from Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And what is your question? We had been studying on the book of Revelations. Mm. Is there any way that you might have some articles on the book of Revelations connecting with, um, I believe it's connected with the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and and the Old Testament. I got kind of lost there. <laughs> it, it looked like we started from the back and went up. I think the the in the beginning, which is the book of Genesis, it gives us a sample of of what it was before sin. From then on, it tells us what our poor human nature is capable of doing on every level. And then we begin to get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the epistles. The Acts of the Apostles. And then Book of Revelations. The Book of Revelations is a symbolic book very difficult to comprehend. The best book to read about heaven, martyrdom, being faithful. Those first chapters scare you to death. I think the Church of Philadelphia is the only one got a good report. Is that right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Um, I would get, if I were you, the Navarra Bible. We'll have another Bible coming out pretty soon. But the Navarra Bible, it's a little expense, about $10, $12. I think it's about $12 a book. We have them all in our library. I would buy one. I would start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Buy yourself a book. Uh, and it has the most marvelous commentary. And they have one special book all by itself on the book of Revelations. Not only does it have the, the book itself, but it has the commentary, a good, solid Catholic commentary. So if you want to, write to me, and we'll, we'll give you all the information about the book of Revelations. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother Angelica. Yeah, where are you from? 
Uh, this is Steve calling from Hershey, Pennsylvania. Oh, Hershey. Yes. Mm. We send you love and kisses, and we will send kisses to you. Oh, Chocolate wonderful. One. Yay. <laughs> yes. Uh, wait, that, wait a minute. Hold on. Before you ask the question, would you mind putting almonds in the kisses? <laughs> Then you'd like to have hugs and kisses. Okay. Okay. <laughs> my, okay. Uh, my question, uh, Mother Angelica, is really two parts. Part one, uh, the, um, do all the orders uh, of nuns have the same preparation period uh, in, in terms of uh, study and so forth before taking final professional vows? No, not the same as ours. Um, in fact, I know very little about active orders. I know they canonically have to have apostasy and an novitiate. That means if you look in our chapel in the mornings, you'll see sisters with white veils. They're novices. I think most orders have a year of postulate, year of novitiate, and many of them in active orders have to go to school, but not during novitiate time. And then most of them have three years of uh, temp what we call temporary vows, which means at any time in that period they can go home. Um, so it, it's all different. It depends on, you know, our life is very strict, and because it's strict, Holy Mother Church is always a mother and always loving and compassionate. She knows it takes more time to make a decision to give it all much more time. Now you have another question. Yes, the second question had to do with what are the sequence of events or training and duties and responsibility before taking the final profession of vows? Okay, first you're a postulant. That's for one year. You'll see uh, two of them in our chapel in the morning. They have a kind of little jumper. During that time, they just begin to learn to live the life. They know where to go and how to get there and why they're going. Then they become novices. Now they're making a, another kind of commitment. For two years, they get lectures, direction. They begin to study the scriptures, they have the divine office. Now their obligation begins to rise with it. So they have the obligation of the divine office. They have adoration hours. After that, they begin to take vows for five years, one year at a time. After that five years, if the community is happy with them, and they are happy with the community, that equals vocation. And then they make a permanent, total commitment in our order, and we're one of the few left that make solemn vows. And we live in a monastery. Did you notice that? We don't live in a convent. And we're nuns. We're not sisters. Everybody calls everybody a sister. But canonically, according to the law, to be a nun, you must live in a monastery. You must say the divine office, that's the scriptures, the Psalms, in public. People have to hear you. And you must have enclosure. That means you're confined to a certain space. You only leave that space if you have to go to a doctor or a dentist or buy a pair of shoes, something you cannot do in the monastery. Many people live and die in that space. If you get too big, in other words, our monastery was built for 14 and now we're 23. Uh, so we don't have room. But we get about 10 inquiries a week. Do you know what that means? That means 10 young women want to go somewhere for a vocation. 
That's 30, 10, 20 to 40 a month. They're no dearth of vocations. They don't know where to go. They don't want to go from an apartment to an apartment. From one permanent to another permanent. Do you know what I mean permanent? Hair. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you weren't getting it. So I <laughs> They don't want to do it. See, the kids today, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, have lived it up by the time they're 16. At that point, they don't want anything but give it up and give it off. They want a superior. I hate to tell you this. They want to tell somebody that feels responsible for their souls and going to tell them exactly what does God wish from them. They're tired of doubts. They're tired of wondering. They're tired. 40 a, week, a month with no place to go. So that's why I say to you, pray for vocations. We have another call. Hello? Hi, sister. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Pennsylvania. And Wonderful. I'm thrilled, I'm thrilled to death I finally got through to you. <laughs> <laughs> and now I can die a happy death. Ah! <laughs> well, what can I do for you? I have a question about vocations. Uh, I hope I can say this right. I'm 44, and about uh, when I was 39 or 40, I, found, I felt a very strong calling to the religious life. Yeah. And, and so I subsequently wrote to many orders, uh, quite a few orders. Yeah. And 99% of them closed the door in my face because mm. of my age. And I'm, I'm wondering when there is such a need for vocations in the church, and I am, you know, and I, I reach out, and, you know, they ask me my age, and I tell them, and they just automatically had nothing to do with me. Well, I think there's good news. There is a seminary called Holy Apostles. Where is that? Connecticut? Connecticut. Huh? Where is it? Cromwell, here we go. We, we know everything here, by God. <laughs> Cromwell, Connecticut. All right, your Holy Apostles Seminary. They take belated vocations. So try again. I'm sure they'll take you. We have another call. Hello? We don't. Okay. Okay, well, you got a question. Yes, Hold on. Wait, she get you uh, this uh, great big, there, this gun in her face. Go ahead. Yes, Mother. Uh, I'd just like to make a comment on the poor Claire nuns. My aunt this year in June will be celebrating her 60th anniversary as a poor Claire nun. Wonderful. She's uh, 83. And I just attribute to, within my family, life and all like this, we have never had a divorce or anything like that. It's the prayers of those good sisters behind those cloistered doors that really, I think, is sparing the raft of God upon the world. So I want oh, to thank you. there's no question in my mind that... that, that uh, and not only cloistered nuns are, are keeping back the, the wrath of God. I think it's many elderly people who really don't have much else to do but pray. You're not wasting your time. You're saving the world. And, and I think you need to know that, that old age is the, is the best wine. Everybody thinks it's gotten sour, but it hasn't gotten sour. It's good. It's good. <laughs> I'm going to be 71 and the 20th next Wednesday, in case you wonder. <laughs> <laughs> I feel better than I have my whole life. See? I know a little bit more about Jesus. I've met a tremendous amount of people. Uh, the, the, the Lord has done many great things for the church. Uh, it's, a, it's a time for battle. I love battles. <laughs> And, and it's a time for battle. It's a time to stand up for your faith. Don't be so wishy-washy. And I, I like that. You see, that, that's the best wine. If you remember at the wedding of Cana, the, the, the steward, he could get over that. He went to the bridegroom and he said, hey, you know, they get the pretty good, oh, terrible wine in the beginning until everybody got pickled. And then... <laughs> 
Yeah, you'd be pretty bad wine at the end. They didn't know what they're drinking. <laughs> See? And he couldn't get over that. He said, you got the good wine, now you put the best wine to last. See, that's all of you. The best wine is now. Now's your opportunity to be example to youth. You, got, you have a marvelous opportunity of being an example to youth. They got something to look forward to. If you go around with a sour face and, you know, griping all the time, I wish I could do this and I wish I could do that, well, you can't. So what? Do something else. <laughs> Prayer wouldn't be a bad thing for you to do. <laughs> Maybe that's why the Lord put you, let you live so long, till you finally learn how to pray. See, so don't, don't shortchange yourself because you're old. What is old? Your soul is the same. <laughs> That's why you can't get over that all these wrinkles and white hair and gray hair, and even when you're dying, it don't look right. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't have what it takes anymore, so why get upset about it? <laughs> Your soul is the same. You have the same love. You, have, you should have more love, more compassion, more understanding. They say wisdom comes with age. <laughs> you know, we used to get some letters from women who'd say their husbands after in their 60s, they began going around with some chick, you know? <laughs> My only comment is that there's no fool like an old goat. <laughs> and so God did not give you old age to waste. He gave you old age to be your very best with wisdom and kindness and compassion and love. See? Uh, you have your best chance to be like Jesus. So rejoice. If there's one thing our youth need today, it's good example and joy. Don't be so sour. Life will go on without you. May be news to you, but it's going to happen. <coughs> but it can be at this moment much better because of you. And don't forget that. Well, I don't want this wonderful day to go without saying this network is brought to you by you and no one else. So please be generous. Summer months are coming when you go on vacation. At this time, you can take a shortwave radio with you and bring EWTN with you. And I hope you will. Write to me. Will you write to Mother Angelica, Irondale, Alabama, 3 Five two one zero. I love you. We depend on you. So be generous. Some of you have listened for twelve years, haven't given a cent. <laughs> be funny when you got to heaven. You say I got here because of EWTN, and Saint Peter said how much it costs, and you said nothing. <laughs> I know.